Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, and welcome to the third in a series of uh, Impulses to Innovation webinars. The first two talks we had were around innovation as a result of the opportunities and threats um, presented to us by COVID. Uh, but this one is a broader talk on innovation and on how to do it properly. John Clegg uh, is an expert in the field and um, he has a, a book that he's recently published, which is well worth a read for anybody interested in, in innovating, uh, whether you're a would-be innovator or, or somebody who, who puts it into practice quite a lot. Um, before I introduce John, I'll just say if you have any questions, please type them into the Ask a Question box and we'll do a Q&A session at the end with John. Uh, but without further ado, I'll, I'll pass over to John to start the uh, pre presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Clegg, and uh, in the coming minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, innovation, uh, how I believe it relates to strategy, and the impact that I see coming from external stakeholders and, and their growing impact, and the way that we need to think about people other than customers and suppliers and competitors as we think about how we're going to innovate in the coming years. A lot of the content in here is available on my website. I blog it for free. Uh, so if you're interested, go take a look at uh, johnmclegg.com. And I'm going to start with a personal story. Um, I've lived in a few different places in the world, and I've lived a number of times in the U.S., and my most recent stint in the U.S. was in Houston, Texas, which is the image on the screen. And I was offered a job in Houston in the middle of 2016 and accepted it. Uh, I was ready to move down there, and just before I was about to move, I was in Houston visiting people, and I got a call saying, I heard you're in town, and, and we've got a new CTO, and we'd like you to come and see him before you start. And so I asked the obvious question. I said, is this another interview? I said, no, 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 it's not another interview. It's just a, just a getting to know you session. So, of course, it was another interview. And I met the guy on the top floor of the uh, head office in uh, downtown Houston. And uh, we talked for about an hour uh, about families and where I was going to be living and all sorts of nice stuff like that. And then at the very end, the punchline came. And uh, he said, well, how long did they tell you you have to develop this new product that you're joining us to, uh, to, to to work on. And I said, well, at the interview, they said uh, up to three years, but I think you can do it quicker. And he put his hand up and he said, let me stop you right there. He said, you've got to tell me if you can't do it in a year because you seem like a really good guy and I'd hate to have to fire you. And I wasn't expecting that, but I said the only thing I could think of at the time, which is you won't fire me. And we shook hands. And I had what seemed like an extraordinarily long ride back down the elevator, thinking, what have I just done? Um, but I realized, as I thought about it during the course of the day, that if I just applied all the stuff I'd learned over the years of developing and selling products and services and understanding what needs were and what, you know, what, what, what could be left out, I could actually do it in a year. And as it turns out, we did it in 11 months and everybody was happy. So... That's a personal story, uh, and that's a kind of intro to the fact that a lot of what I talk about over the uh, coming minutes is going to be a personal view of what innovation really means and uh, how it should be uh, thought of. Now, innovation is very much about bringing uh, new stuff to um, established markets or bringing new stuff to new markets. Uh, established markets tend to be populated by incumbents and they tend to stick to what they know. They're quite stubborn, and they're very hard to move. They, they, they've got stuff that works, and they like it where they are. Thank you very much. Um, if you're going to try and break into an established market, it's often not a good idea to try and copy those big guys. And if you look at uh, a lot of people we'd think of as being the innovators in our time, Tesla haven't become big by copying Ford and making cars with petrol engines and diesel engines. And Airbnb haven't become big by copying Hilton and building hotels. Apple didn't become big by copying Nokia and making old-fashioned telephone handsets. Um, you need to do something a little bit different, and you need to be a little bit less stubborn in your thinking. 
and stubbornness is definitely unlikely to be appropriate in times of uh, rapid change. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. We've got Brexit, we've got uh, global supply chain issues, we've got climate change, and of course, at least in the short term, we've got global inflation. And all of those things mean that the environment is changing quite rapidly around us. We're literally in the rapids. And that rapid change means that rapid development and rapid innovation become the rule, not the exception. You have to think about how you're going to do things quickly. And when you're in the rapids, you really need a rapids guide. And uh, hopefully some of the things I'll talk about in this webinar will give you at least some of the tools that that rapids guide is going to need in their rapids guide uh, toolbox. But I'm going to start by talking about what I believe innovation actually is. A lot of people think that innovation is inventing something new, having that light bulb moment where something the world has never seen before pops into the inventor's head. Um, well, let's look at Airbnb, uh, which is what the image in this slide is supposed to represent. I'm not sure that's true of Airbnb. Airbnb hasn't really created anything, or at least hasn't created anything physical. Um, it's got software, but that software lives in your smartphone or maybe on your PC. And it lives in an operating system or a browser that was developed by somebody else. They use your hardware, your smartphone or your PC to deliver a service to you. Uh, they leverage your ISP to deliver it to you, and they leverage assets, which is like things like houses or apartments owned by other people, to deliver the service to you. And they become one of the biggest accommodation providers in the world without owning any real estate. So they're a great example of innovation, and they illustrate that innovation isn't really about inventing things. It can be about taking things that exist and recombining them in a slightly different way. And uh, a, a great quote, which um, a kind of tutor and mentor of mine at business school uh, introduced to me in this context, is on the screen here. William Gibson, the science fiction writer, said, the future is already here. It's just very unevenly distributed. And that's a very good way of thinking about innovation. A lot of the things we need for the future are already around us. Uh, we just need to find ways of putting them together differently. And... A great example of um, putting things together differently is uh, Dyson. Um, there's a guy called Matt Ridley who wrote a book called The Rational Optimist. And uh, in the book, uh, he said that recombinant innovation is where ideas have sex and basically where ideas come together and produce something which is new and different, but which is based on those existing ideas. Um, the COVID hood, which was in an earlier webinar in this series, is a great example from a technical perspective of repurposing, taking ideas from the bulk solids industry. And a similar story is James Dyson's story. Um, he originally, um, or, well not originally, but many years before Dyson vacuum cleaners, he had a product called the ball barrow. And this ball barrow is like a wheelbarrow with a big thing that looked like an inflatable beach ball on the front. I mean, some of you may remember seeing it. And he had an issue with uh, manufacturing this thing because uh, the, uh, the, the powder coating for the uh, metal parts was difficult because the filters were getting clogged. And somebody said, well, think about using a different technology. Don't use physical filters. But he looked at uh, industrial cyclones to separate the powder from the air, and thereby he addressed his production problem with the ball barrel. And then uh, sometime later came that eureka moment. He, he now had this cyclone solution in his head. And he saw a problem with his vacuum cleaner at home where the bag kept getting clogged. As, and some of you who are old enough may also remember what vacuum cleaner bags used to be like. And Dyson realized that that technology of cyclones could be used to separate dust from air in a vacuum cleaner and solve that problem inherent in existing cleaner designs. And it was the, that was the invention. And um, it was a brilliant one, but it wasn't something new. It was taking existing technology and he actually repurposed it twice over. He took it from industrial cyclones to uh, cleaning the, uh, the the powder coating machinery for his ball barrow to putting it into uh, the, uh, the the vacuum cleaner. So repurposing of uh, existing ideas. Now, I tried to find a definition of invent uh, of innovation. Sorry, and. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary, it, it, it kind of helps us, uh, especially by saying introducing something new, especially a product. So 
That gives us a bit of clear water between innovation and invention. It's not about coming up with the idea, it's about turning it into a product, according to the OED. And then a couple of heroes of mine, and hopefully heroes of yours too, Peter Drucker, uh, back in 1993, he said, innovation is a specific tool of entrepreneurs, the means by which they exploit change as an opportunity for a different business or a different service. So Drucker's definition is taking us towards delivering something new for our customers or for our stakeholders as a result of innovation. And then Michael Porter, I think, really nailed it, a new way of doing things that is commercialized. So I think Porter's definition really gets us to the nub, which is the fact that innovation isn't inventing something. Innovation is actually commercializing things. And I'll come back to this later, but I believe that innovation is in fact a value chain uh, where needs and capabilities, needs of customers or stakeholders and capabilities of your own organization feed into this chain, create value for the customers and stakeholders, and importantly, capture value for your own organization. An innovation, I'm going to suggest, always includes the creation of value. And that creation of value can be, it can be making people more money. It could be saving people time. Uh, it can be making tasks easier. It could be improving society. It could be making people happy. It can be ap uh, appealing to higher level emotional or uh, personal values. It's never just about the idea. And uh, I'll finish with a quote by Peter Drucker here. The most common source of mistakes in management decisions is the emphasis on finding the right answer rather than the right question. And often the right answer is driven by, oh, we've had this great new idea. What are we going to do with it? The right question is really driven by how are we going to create value and how are we going to benefit people uh, with this new thing, uh, whether it's a product or a service or a business model. And if you can create value, then you're asking the right question. And if you can find ways to create value, then you've answered that right question. So let's look at how not to do it. Um, this is a picture of the Ford Edsel. And uh, the Ford Edsel was a uh, car launched with a great fanfare in 1957 by Ford. Never before a car like it was actually their uh, marketing slogan uh, as they launched it. And it's worth looking at the timeline of the Edsel. Um, they began development of this new flagship model in 1954. Um, they launched it with this fanfare having spent $250 million, which in those days was quite a lot of money. And in 1960, they discontinued it, uh, having incurred losses on the product of $350 million, which in 1960 was a remarkably large amount of money. They didn't sell it through Ford showrooms. They, they created their own showrooms. And uh, they, uh, they displaced uh, existing Ford dealers. They created new Edsel dealers. They displaced like Lincoln dealers. They, they, they took dealers from other uh, manufacturers. They created 1,200 showrooms across the U.S. And on the very first day, 2.8 million people visited those showrooms and uh, saw the car on the very first day. But over three years, those dealers only sold an average 93 cars each. That's about 30 cars a year or... Um, well, yeah, it's sort of two and a half cars a month or something. It was a remarkable commercial failure. And the reason it was a commercial failure, without going into too much detail, is that Ford invested all that money in what they thought people wanted. And what they thought people wanted, to be fair to them, was informed by research they'd done at about 1950. Um, and the development of this new car was delayed by um, issues around the uh, Korean War and short-term development and uh, economic issues in the US. And by 1954, when they actually started working on it, the market had changed. People didn't want these huge flagship vehicles anymore. They were getting more concerned about economy and more concerned about fuel prices, and they, they wanted smaller cars, more compact models. And their market had disappeared, but it seems like Ford never actually bothered to check. They never went back to the customers and said, is this what you want? They just produced it, assumed it was what people wanted, delivered it with a big fanfare, and then were surprised when nobody bought it. And the message is that this great idea you have is useless unless it provides value for a customer, something a customer needs, or something that another stakeholder needs.
Now, you don't have to produce products and services. You can innovate in, uh, in terms of business models. Uh, Starbucks now sells coffee all over the world um, from pretty humble beginnings in Seattle back in 1971. And their idea was to bring good tasting coffee. And for those of you who went to the US in the 70s and the 80s, the coffee was pretty dire. Um, but after bringing to, trying to bring good tasting coffee and recreate the atmosphere of an Italian espresso bar in the US, they changed the customer experience and they, they, they created an experience around drinking coffee which was uh, accessible, comfortable, fairly unique, but all the time retaining the good coffee. And they transformed the expectations of American coffee drinkers and effectively created a new market for themselves. So you don't just have to think about innovation in terms of uh, products and services, but think about innovation in terms of um, business models. Coffee wasn't a new product. Selling coffee wasn't a new service, but providing coffee to people in the way that Starbucks did was a new business model, and they were successful as a result of that. Um, most companies have got a chief technology officer or a vice president of technology or a director of engineering or somebody who's responsible for innovation in technology. If you think about your own company, who's responsible for innovating business models? Or do you just assume that the business model is always going to be the same and is going to be perpetuated uh, forever? And how many companies do you think have somebody that's actually responsible for thinking strategically about new business models? And uh, I'm going to suggest that it's not very many. So kind of borrowing and bending words from the Ford Edsel advertising slogan, I'm going to talk a little bit about a business model innovation failure, or, or maybe it was just a near miss. Maybe it was almost a business model innovation failure. And I said that I'd thread a few personal threads through this. And this is a personal one for me. <clears throat> this is a picture I took about a year ago, maybe two years ago now, um, because I wasn't there a year ago at Manchester City's uh, ground in, uh, in the UK. Um, I've been a supporter for many years. Um, I have a season ticket, which means that I get rained on more than most people get rained on. But I almost stopped supporting them um, a few months ago when the club, along with a number of other clubs around Europe, managed to alienate their fans, their partners, other clubs, their employees, their players and their managers, their local communities and their regulators by trying to create a European Super League. And it was a bit like the Ford Edsel thing. They thought this was what people were going to want, but they didn't bother to ask the people who were their customers and uh, their stakeholders. Um, after 48 hours of pressure from their own employees, uh, from fans, from the media, from the government, uh, physical protests, uh, in a time when people were dissuaded from protesting uh, out of doors, um, the plan was uh, withdrawn. Um, you'd imagine... It requires a special effort and special skill to alienate all of your stakeholders at the same time, to upset everybody who's uh, associated with your business all at the same time. But the clubs that propose the formation of this European Super League seem to have managed to do just that. And this example, it doesn't just underline the importance of keeping customers, fans, partners, other clubs that would have been other clubs in the Premier League that would have been upset, employees and so on on board. But it also underlines the importance to any modern business of doing right by the society within which it operates. And that's a great segue into talking about stakeholder needs. Um, stakeholders, external stakeholders, including NGOs like Extinction Rebellion, as uh, indicated in the uh, image here, are becoming increasingly important to us as we begin to think about how we uh, how we address the needs of broader society and not just uh, customers and uh, uh, competitors and, and how we're forced to think about the needs of uh, broader society. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, an, another tutor of mine, a guy called Rafael Ramirez, Oxford University, and he wrote about how the business idea is basically about how an organisation creates value. And that value doesn't necessarily create profit or shareholder wealth. It can also be the enhancement of the public good, the fulfillment of an interest group's increased capacity, better art, or other increased improvement in some value. So you can create value uh, in all sorts of ways. And uh, one of the ways we need to do that 
is to think about how we address stakeholder needs, how we address the needs of society uh, much more. Again, a personal story. Um, I've worked in the oil and gas industry for most of my career. I semi-retired from my last role in the summer of 2020. And towards the end of last year, I began to put together some proposals for development of some new technology for oil and gas drilling with a colleague. And uh, we went to speak to a few people about it. And we were advised, actually, I wouldn't do this if I were you, because people don't invest in hydrocarbons anymore. And people don't invest in fossil fuels anymore. And uh, we were kind of okay because we saw the opportunity to achieve a number of things, to to achieve our individual needs by gaining investment for development of the technology and to do a bit more good by repurposing it and uh, changing the scope and changing the specification and identifying an opportunity to develop technology for the geothermal industry where we can get investment or where we we're currently getting investment and that's a personal story but it illustrates the fact that there are stakeholders other than customers and suppliers and competitors who can prevent you from doing things and uh, investment is a uh, big one and the other thing I wanted to point out here is that there's actually a lot of good that can accrue from doing the right thing I'll tell you a story about a, um, a, a fintech called uh, Mambu. And Mambu saw an opportunity at what a lot of people call the base of the pyramid. The base of the pyramid is uh, the large majority of um, potential consumers in the world who don't really have very much wealth and don't have very much money to spend. And they saw an opportunity to provide banking services. Um, to individuals who had no access to banking and also to about 250 million small organizations who had no access to credit. And they built a bank to serve these customers and they were able to do so because of the reduction in the cost of banking technology um, by leveraging a very highly cost-effective cloud-based core banking platform. And uh, they succeeded in doing that. Now, by designing their technology and by designing their service to address people who had very little money, they were able to do something that was extraordinarily cost-effective. And if you look on their website, they're now a global operation that provides cloud-based banking services with a customer list including established names like ABN AMRO and uh, Santander, as you can see in this image here. So the message there is that Mambu has grown from the base of the pyramid to much more established first world markets, where its inherent efficiency and its minimal cost base is providing it with significant competitive advantage uh, while doing good for microfinance institutions and their many customers in emerging markets and without losing connection with its roots. Now, many people might have heard of Porter's Five Forces. I, I think I might have mentioned them earlier in the talk. Um, you know, the, the forces exerted by customers, um, suppliers, competitors, new entrants, and substitutions. And I think that as you begin to think about doing good for society, and as you begin to think about satisfying the needs of investors I was talking about in the previous slide, you come up with a very different approach to uh, strategy. <clears throat> and suddenly, you have a different set of five forces that act on your company. And any of these five forces can cause you problems and can constrain your uh, operations. But conversely, all of these five forces can help you and support you if you address them in the right way. And these forces are customers. And um, surprise then, no, no surprise that they're still there. But customers' attitudes are changing. Uh, maybe people want to buy renewable energy now. Maybe people want to buy electric vehicles. Not necessarily doing it for the right reasons. But they're still changing their, um, their, their their thoughts and their philosophies and the, uh, and, and their values are changing. Uh, regulation is not always the strongest of powers, but regulators do have influence, and I think that might be in the case in the in the case of the European Super League. I think threats from the UK government certainly helped to uh, dismantle that particular project. I talked about the withholding power of investors, and similarly, there's also potential withholding power from uh, employees. If employees don't like your values. I think they're increasingly choosing not to work for you. And if you happen to be in an industry like oil and gas, where um, it, 
which is almost becoming the new tobacco industry, uh, where it's becoming unpopular, it's increasingly difficult to persuade young people to come and work for you. And you have to think about how am I going to address that? And of course, NGOs, uh, people like Extinction Rebellion, we saw Greenpeace. Um, there are many, many NGOs who can have quite a disruptive influence on your business um, if you don't engage in the correct way. And I cover this in a lot more detail in a book I wrote, which I'm going to talk to you about uh, later on. But for a specific example, if I refer you back to um, the, the COVID hood, which was talked about uh, in a uh, previous webinar in this series, I think a lot of the issues we saw there were actually regulation issues. And uh, they were actually non-technical issues. And what if we, we, if we had a narrow focus on the market, what we think of as maybe non-market issues, which caused some of the biggest uh, challenges there. So I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, risk and uh, uncertainty. And I'm going to illustrate um, both of those with the um, unfortunate experience over the last few years of uh, Boeing. Um, we both know, uh, sorry, we all know uh, what happened with the Boeing 737 MAX and some of its early flights. And uh, I think that aircraft is in the process of coming back into service, but I think its reputation was always going to be tainted. And um, I think without going into too much detail, what happened with the 737 MAX, uh, you know, the, the dynamics of the aeroplane were changed by fitting larger engines, uh, which had to be forward of the wing, as you can see in the picture here, and therefore uh, changed the balance of the aircraft, uh, therefore changed the control system. And everything that happened there was really stuff that Boeing designed and Boeing did. Um, and so it was stuff that could reasonably have been foreseen if you'd have been inside the company, in my opinion. And probably is stuff which falls into the domain of, um, of, of risk. Um, but if you think about risk and uh, uncertainty, there's a guy called Frank Knight in 1924. And Frank Knight said that a risk whose likelihood can be estimated or measured is not an uncertainty at all. And that's why risk management can be very useful. And risk management, I'm sure, could have been quite useful to Boeing. But the other thing that hit Boeing over the uh, last few years, of course, was COVID-19 and the demand for uh, aeroplanes and parts for aeroplanes and much of their business collapsed as a result of travel bans, uh, which we're still seeing today all over the world uh, in response to uh, the emergence of COVID and more recently to the emergence of, uh, of new variants. Um, and it would be very hard for a company to do risk analysis, traditional risk analysis and risk management, which would account for things like uh, the emergence of a pandemic. So that true uncertainty uh, is dangerous to companies. But I'm going to argue that it can actually be quite useful and can actually be very valuable. And understanding uncertainty and understanding that the future is by no means secure and that things are going to happen which we don't expect can become a source of competitive advantage. And the reason it can is um, this phenomenon called perfect competition. And um, Peter Thiel, one of the founders of um, PayPal, amongst other people, has described this. And perfect competition is basically where everybody knows everything. Everybody's got access to the same skills, the same knowledge. There are no barriers to entry. There's no ability to differentiate. Low prices, low margins little ability to capture any value. It's not really an environment that any of us would want to operate in. Not particularly uh, attractive. But we can avoid it because of uncertainty. Um, true uncertainty allows us to avoid this perfect competition where everything is known. And this is why uncertainty can be a source of competitive advantage. Uh, but to leverage uncertainty you have to have some idea about what's going to happen in the future. And I'm not suggesting we become futurologists and try and predict the future. But I'm suggesting that there are tools that we can use. And one of those is scenario planning. Uh, scenario planning is all about the creation of multiple, equally plausible, and this is really important, equally valued visions of possible futures, that there's no preferred future and there's no most likely future. With scenario planning, you have three or four um, different 
futures, radically different futures, any of which is likely. And what scenarios are is effectively stories that are being told to you from those possible futures. And they can be really useful because what you can use them for is to develop and to test and to future-proof different strategies. So you could take your existing strategy and say, is it going to work in any of these different futures? And if the answer in any of them is no, then maybe you need a different strategy. Uh, Shell does it really well. Uh, this is Shell's latest set of uh, climate change uh, scenarios um, where they see the world is going to decarbonize uh, over the next uh, century or so. Uh, but as they say, the issue is speed. And um, depending on whether to do it quickly or slowly, uh, we can limit global temperature rise to anywhere between 1.5 and 2.5 degrees Celsius, uh, according to Shell. And they say, you know, any of these is equally likely. Any of these could happen. What happens to our business in each of these three different uh, scenarios? Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, scenario planning in detail because uh, there are many different ways of doing it. Um, I'm aware of uh, at least eight. I've got a preferred one. Uh, but if you need to learn about it, the best thing to do is to read a book, uh, is to go on a program. I attended the Oxford Scenario Planning uh, Program um, at Side Business School in Oxford, which was an excellent program. Or uh, talk to somebody who's got experience in uh, in developing uh, scenarios. It's uh, it's a bit of an art, but it's uh, very worthwhile uh, if, you, um, if you haven't addressed it uh, previously. Right, I now want to talk a bit about uh, strategy um, because I don't think it's a good idea to have an innovation strategy. Um, I think innovation is one of those things that can't be bolted onto the side of your organisation. It has to be a fundamental part of what you do and therefore innovation must actually be a key part of your... Uh, must, must be implicit in your strategy. Your strategy must include innovation and the two shouldn't be uh, separable. And uh, Michael Porter taught us about strategy. He said it's about being different to others, about creating fit between your activities. And I think I really love this part of it. It's about being clear what not to do. And um, I think that that fit includes matching needs and capabilities. So in a minute, I'll come back to that value chain I talked about earlier. But customer and stakeholder needs and capabilities that you have if you can match those together, then you have the, the basis, the genesis of a uh, successful strategy. But you need to be clear about what your capabilities are. <clears throat> this, um, David Sainsbury wrote a book uh, last year about um, innovation and its impact on uh, the UK. Um, and he talks in there about offshore wind and offshore wind structures. And um, I'm not going to be too controversial here, but the UK government is sending a lot of store by offshore wind. And I think it's hoping that uh, it's going to create a lot of employment uh, for, the, uh, for, for the UK. And I hope it does too. Uh, but there are some snags. Uh, and one of them is that uh, the UK is very good at building offshore structures. But what we do is we tend to build bespoke structures and uh, structures in small numbers. And offshore wind installations uh, benefit from economies of scale where they're all the same. I mean, basically the structure under each um, wind turbine um, in each location is going to be broadly similar, if not identical. And so building the basis for offshore wind is going to favor a uh, company or a country which has the capability of mass producing. And so you've got to be very clear about building strategy on real capabilities and not on capabilities that you hope you have. So I talked about fit from Michael Porter a minute or two ago, and that fit must align those capabilities and needs. And once you've got capabilities and needs aligned, then you can come up with your idea. What idea can you have? Or what invention can you have? that satisfies the needs of customers or other stakeholders, as we talked about earlier, and at the same time leverages the capabilities either that you have in your organisation or that you can get from outside. And then, based on the idea, how can you create value for some of those people? 
And once you've created that value, how do you capture some of the value yourself? And I think there are six ways to create value. Um, business model on innovation we talked about in the context of Starbucks is changing the operating model. Basically using the same stuff, but changing the operating model. Um, product or service innovation is bringing in new technologies and new solutions uh, by changing, exist changing existing products or services. Um, disruptive innovation. It wasn't really time to talk about that a lot here. But disruptive innovation is introducing scale-back technology or solutions to offer a less capable but minimum viable product. And I think a great example of uh, disruptive innovation is companies like Ryanair and EasyJet, who produced a much cheaper, um, much lower value uh, service uh, that uh, took off because um, customers liked it. They liked the low price. And they didn't necessarily need the reserved seats, the in-flight meals, or the, you know, the, the, the comfort that the more established airlines were providing. So that was uh, a great example of understanding what's the minimum value that somebody will accept and then pitching a product at, uh, at that point. Um, systems innovation is looking at what goes on outside the company and changing how processes interact with each other. Process innovation is about improving techniques inside your company uh, to um, improve your internal processes. And of course, social innovation is improving conditions for others, which can lead to uh, benefits in terms of um, entry into more established markets, as we saw in the example of Mambu. And I think there are three key tests for your strategy as it encompasses innovation. One of them is that it must create value in one or more of those six ways by meeting one or more clear needs of your customers and or your stakeholders. The delivery of value must not depend on capabilities that you don't have. That's really important. And you also have to have a clear way to capture value, to take something for yourself that's acceptable to your customers and or your stakeholders. If you can't capture value, there's no point in doing it. And normally we think of value capture in terms of uh, profit but there are other ways of capturing value as well. And in terms of innovation and the way that you develop your strategy and execute your strategy, one of my favorite quotes uh, attributed to Albert Einstein, I don't know if he actually said it, I suspect he didn't, everything should be made as simple as possible, uh, but no simpler. And I think that is really my approach to innovation is make your processes, make your systems, make the way you think about things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Now, I, I could stop here, but I wanted to say a word or two about remote working. And I saw an article in Harvard Business Review recently that compared the actions of toddlers as they learn with the actions of new companies trying to enter new markets. And when toddlers are learning, they don't try and compete and outdo each other, they copy and mimic each other and they try and learn from each other. And that's very much the way that startups operate, um, but not so much the way that established companies uh, operate. Um, route 128 outside Boston, for those of a certain age, is the route that influenced Jonathan Richmond's song Roadrunner, um, which was kind of one of the themes of my uh, teenage years. But more importantly, Route 128 was also the center of the technology industry in the US when Silicon Valley was mostly still farmland. But gradually, Silicon Valley forged ahead and overtook Route 128, which was once known as America's technology highway. And why did it do that? Because the companies in Route 128 were closed and isolated, and they held highly, tightly to technology. And their employees had very few places to mix socially. They, they didn't mix in bars after work, or they didn't uh, socialize at the weekends. They worked for a company, they went home, they went back and they worked for the same company. And so ideas didn't spread, and that glue that makes clusters sticky and makes companies continue to cluster in a particular location was absent. Silicon Valley was the opposite. Silicon Valley had the, an abundance of bars, clubs, socials, after-work clubs, and other hangouts. And as a result, ideas flowed between individuals and companies, and innovation was primed. It's clear that which location was the winner, 
And it's equally clear, to me at least, that the success of Silicon Valley came from the social migration of ideas and the cultural environment that enabled that social migration. So there's a guy called Matthew Syed who um, wrote a book called Rebel Ideas, and he talked about Route 128 and Silicon Valley in the book Rebel Ideas. Uh, he writes a newspaper column for the Sunday Times, and in that column last year, he re revisited that story, and he pointed out how COVID-19 made everywhere look like that Massachusetts described in his book, with employees isolated from social contact and not mixing between or even within companies. And a lot has been said and written about the death of the office and the death of the city and a future in which knowledge workers stay at home and communicate through Zoom or Teams or some equally impersonal method. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase Mike, Mark Twain here. I hope and I believe that reports of the death of the office in the city are greatly exaggerated. Because given what we know about the importance of social interaction to innovation, the death of the office would also lead to the death of innovation. Those ideas that spring from serendipitous conversations and uh, chance meetings and people overhearing conversations wouldn't happen. And uh, that would do more damage to the economy in the long term than the uh, economic shock of uh, 2020. Um, if we want to innovate, I think we have to find ways to continue to congregate. So the key learnings here, um, we're in times of rapid change um, and unpredictable change. And so we need that rapid guide. Innovation is not the same as invention. And innovation is really a value chain where creating and capturing value is everything. Non-market value is now increasingly important. And it's also important to embrace uncertainty because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the future with Brexit, climate change, new variants, you name it. And harness that uncertainty as a source of competitive advantage. Collaborate with people. Don't be protective. Don't try and go it alone. But use as much input as you can and use as many capabilities and resources as you can and collaborate with people. We have to collaborate in order to innovate. Now, if you want to know more, um, I wrote a book uh, which has got a lot more detail and a lot more concepts in than the uh, the, the last 40 minutes of uh, talking. Um, it's available um, through normal retailers. Um, on my website, there's a bookstore tab, and that will take you to places where you can uh, get hold of the book or an ebook uh, if you happen to be interested. If you want to hear more, uh, in May next year, we're planning to explore some of these concepts in more detail through real-life case histories with an opportunity to question the presenters of the uh, real-life case histories. Uh, so look out for further announcements on that. And it's still in development, but you should see something uh, coming up soon. And with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you for your time and uh, attention. Uh, that's the end of the formal part of the presentation, and uh, I'm now happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, John, for that uh, very informative presentation. That was uh, very enjoyable. I think everyone will agree. So I've got a few questions um, that I'd like to ask you. Uh, I'll also start off with a, a quote that's been sent in that may also have been Albert Einstein. I quite like this one. It's, um, innovation is the art of turning ideas into invoices. Uh, I think I'll be borrowing that one. But we'll oh, I love some that. Questions. I'll be doing that one too. I hadn't come across that one before. Um, but the first question I've got is, um, what's the single most important issue, in your opinion, that can either impede or support innovation? Oh, thanks. That, that's a good question, Mike. And um, it's something I talked about earlier in the um, in the presentation, but it, it's, the, it's that word value and uh, it's understanding what it is and how it's generated. Um, a lot of the work I did through my career um, on innovation was done. Uh, I was working with a guy called Andy Murdoch, a great friend of mine, who unfortunately uh, he passed away a few years ago. And uh, actually, the book is dedicated to uh, Andy. But I remember Andy used to complain that a lot of our sort of sales and marketing operation, the company we worked for, 
with a bunch of waiters and they'd go to people and say, what would you like? And um, what is it that you want? And um, it's very important to understand the difference between what people want or what they think they want and what they actually need. Because it, if, if you don't take the effort to understand what they need and how it creates value for them, kind of put yourself in their shoes and imagine you're in their business and yeah, they say they want this particular feature, this particular service, this particular product or whatever. Is it actually going to create any benefit for them, any lasting benefit, or is it just a kind of a whim? Uh, and if it's kind of a whim, you can go away and work on it for a year or two and come back, say, here it is. And they just go, oh, really? Uh, you know, do you expect me to buy that? Um, whereas if you're providing something that they need and creates value, then um, they'll kind of bite your hand off. Uh, so I think that the, the biggest thing is understanding what that value is and making sure that you know that people are going to buy the product, the service, whatever. Uh, the Ford Edsel story is a great way of illustrating how Ford didn't understand that they weren't creating uh, value, but they learned from the mistakes. And 30 years later, um, Ford produced the Explorer, which was the first SUV that became really popular in the US. And and the way that they sold that was they talked to buyers about the lifestyle it would create for them. It, it's exciting, it's adventurous, it keeps families together, allows you to commune with nature and so on. And they created all of these values, not necessarily monetary values, but values nonetheless that uh, enticed uh, buyers and um, and allowed them to have a successful product. So they, they kind of learned from their mistakes. But yeah, I, I, misunderstanding value, I think, is, is the single most important potential pitfall. Thank you. Um, the next question is talking about the value chain that you mentioned. Which part of the value chain do you think people struggle with the most? Um, I actually think it's the, uh, the the bit that gets. If you think about the value chain, it, it kind of goes from matching needs and capabilities, creating ideas, creating value, and then the last part of it is capturing value. And I think this is just from personal experience, but more than one of the companies I've worked for and with over the years, in fact, I'd almost go so far as to say the majority of companies I've worked for and with over the years, um, hasn't really been very good at capturing value. Um, because you, you, you create this value for a customer, for a stakeholder, or whatever, and then you have the right to take some of it for yourself. And conventionally in business, you'd think about taking that in the form of profit. It doesn't necessarily have to be profit, but that's an easy way of thinking about it. You, you have to make some money on what you're doing, partly because that's the purpose of your organization and partly because if you don't, you're not going to be able to create any value in the future because you're not going to be around to do it. And I've, I've seen so many companies underestimate the value that they create, not understand the value that they create, and then fail to, uh, to, to, to capture that value. And maybe a couple of ways of thinking about that. One of them is if you really understand the value that you create for a customer or for a stakeholder, you basically can price up to the maximum you can charge is the value that you create. If you charge more than the value you create, then nobody's going to be interested. If you charge slightly less, then you've got a fighting chance of being able to sell something, but normally you charge significantly less, so some, a fraction of it. But understanding what the value you create is allows you to uh, understand how much value you can capture, therefore allows you to uh, price things correctly. And the other thing I noticed, I didn't talk about it in the, um, the talk, but I have written about it, is studies that show that the most reluctant people when it comes to increasing prices are quite often your own sales organization and the least reluctant people when it comes to increasing prices, although they might protest a bit, are customers. And the reason why customers are generally okay with uh, price increases is because they understand the value that you're uh, providing and they can do that mental calculation. Yeah, this is still worth it for us. And I, I think the complicated reasons why sales organizations don't always like to increase prices. And I think some of those are around short-term thinking and short-term incentives. But I fear that sometimes it's actually around not understanding what the value is that's being created. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question about, obviously, innovation is is a, a journey, if you like to use a cliche. But uh, what about that eureka moment? Is, is there no place for that sudden flash of inspiration as a seed for innovation? Um, I, actually, yeah, I, I, I think there is. Um, but I, I think it, it generally, 
it's very unusual uh, in my experience. In fact, I can only think of, I'm trying to think of any times in my experience when it's happened for somebody to have this fantastic idea and invent some, you know, we've just invented unobtainium, this new material, and this is what we're going to do with it. And, and generally those ideas, they're actually seeded by, um, by, by some kind of requirement that comes from either in, inside the company or the organization or from the market. And, uh, you know, necessity of the mother of invention is maybe a bit overused, but I think it's very true. And generally, um, there is a eureka moment, but it comes in response to uh, to some kind of a need. Um, when Isaac Newton was um, actually in quarantine, um, like I am at the moment, uh, trying to understand the laws of nature when he saw the apple fall from the tree. And um, it, it was that need of trying to understand what was going on in the world that allowed him to have that kind of eureka moment when he saw the apple fall and, and, and figure out what was going on. We talked about James Dyson earlier. Um, Gutenberg invented the modern printing press. Um, and uh, that was actually driven by a need for the mass production of Bibles in uh, in Europe in the Middle Ages. And uh, Gutenberg's idea was to take an olive press and movable type that had come from uh, Korea and combine the two uh, into the modern printing press. So those eureka moments do exist, but they tend to be seeded by understanding of uh, something that is needed by society or by the market or by the individual, rather than just completely coming, you know, kind of coming completely out of the blue. Okay, and unless we get any more questions in, this should be the final question. That's a short one. Okay. What, uh, why did you write the book? Uh, actually, <laughs> this is quite actually because of a Eureka moment. Um, I was, um, it's a great illustration of um, the importance of um, clearing your mind if you are trying to uh, solve problems and uh, come up with ideas. I was actually out when I was living in Houston, I was out cycling and um, I had all these ideas about innovation and product development kind of rolling around inside my head. And I was trying to figure out a way of doing something with them. And I was just cycling down uh, the, um, the the side of one of the, um, the, they call them bayous there, like little rivers. And I thought I should write a book about this. And it just popped into my head. I've been very passionate about innovation for years and what it is and how to do it. And uh, so I, I thought, I don't know, I'll, I'll write a book. And I originally, it was going to be one book. Um, but I began to generate so much content that I finished up um, putting two together. Um, the, the first one, it, it, it very much kind of works around the uh, the, the content of the, uh, the talk today, which is about what innovation actually is and how it relates to uh, strategy and, and how to think about it and how to think about things like value and uh, introduces the, uh, the, the value chain. And okay, we actually have had another question just on the subject of that. I think you were probably about to continue on. Um, what will be the theme for part two of the book or, or your second book, uh, if you can say? So yeah, part part two, it's about 75% complete. Um, so part two is, it's more like what I originally thought part one was going to be. So that's more of, of a kind of a how-to guide. So whereas part one is a bit more philosophical and about strategy and value and so on, and how to deal with uh, customers and stakeholders. Part two is more about how to do things, like how to write specifications, um, what processes to use for developing new products uh, and services, um, how, to, um, how, how, to, how to measure success, uh, how to select projects and, uh, and, and so on. So, so yeah, part, part one is a bit more philosophical and part two is a little bit more practical. Brilliant. Uh, Fantastic. I think that concludes the questions. Um, so I'd just like to great. thank everyone for uh, for watching today and, and joining in with some some great questions. Uh, as John said in his presentation, we we will have a a webinar Q and A sort of panel session coming up uh, around April May time next year. We're working on that at the moment. Um, if anybody wants to participate in that, please get in touch. Um, through John's website or uh, through the IMAC and, and get in touch with us through the Northwest Process Industries Division uh, and, and we'll, we'll have some discussions about that and get you involved. But, uh, other than that, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thanks, everybody, from me for your time. And, and yeah, just echo what Stephen said. Do, do get in touch because we'd love to have some interesting uh, case histories for uh, our event next year. Thank you.